Hello, my name is Greg Soulsby and welcome to my presentation on data point modelling. I'll be introducing you to uh, my view of data point modelling uh, with the hope that you get the same sense of uh, possibility that I do. I'm thinking that you will have your own information management problems uh, given that you're listening to a conversation on data points. Um, it's just that I want to look at data point modelling in the context of other information management tools um, touch on their strengths and weaknesses and look at how they relate to each other. Uh, it'll be an idiosyncratic uh, view. Um, as far as I know there's no formal definition of data point modelling uh, so this one will be mine. What I do hope is that you get a, a sense of how data point modelling uh, can be a tool in your kit bag. Uh, if you're looking at, to tackle some of these new big XBRL taxonomies like CoREP and Solvency 2 in the EU um, or maybe explore XBRL like technologies in house, then I hope you'll see uh, how data point modeling might be able to help you be faster, more agile uh, than you otherwise would have been. In music, um, if you like jazz and I like pop and somebody else likes country, then uh, that's considered good, uh, a good thing. Uh, but I think all of us are going to agree on, we need to agree on what is middle C. Um, and so it is in, uh, in data management. Um, there can only be one underlying core version of the truth, uh, but we can arrange, slice and dice, and view that truth uh, in our own special way. Uh, for data management, um, the problem is ha how to scale. So in, in music, you know, the jazz musician can uh, play the sax and the classic uh, musician can play the piano, but, and they, uh, but they can both play middle C independently of each other. Um, but even the company, you know, client billing says, you know, clients must have a legal name, uh, but then the marketing department wants to send the customer sales to the ad agency and there's no way we can send the uh, client name uh, outside the firm. Um, we of course we take a copy, um, cut the data up to how we want it to look, and then uh, now of course we've lost the um, single version of the truth. You know, our customers change their addresses and we've got it in two places, and uh, we've lost that ability to understand the truth. So uh, in in any firm, that problems exist uh, in uh, thousands of cases. And uh, there can only be diseconomies of scale. You know, the, compound, the problems compound as the uh, data scope gets wider. So let's have a, uh, a look at some of the approaches people have used uh, for, for managing these uh, data management problems. So the first tool that uh, comes to mind is the logical data model. Um, the development of this approach was driven by the need for a clear, unambiguous data design and uh, the LDM has been a big part of my career so I'm a massive fan of understanding your data in as a structured concrete way as possible but uh, the more concrete the harder people find to slice and dice uh, for their own purposes uh, they find it hard to be agile in, in my experience um, the main problem uh, with LDMs is the appalling uh, quality of their design so um, concepts like generality and abstraction seem uh, well understood by uh, a few people but total strangers to most. Um, but even with optimum design, people still need to be uh, flexibly assembling views of the data and um, the LDM is not a great tool for that. Uh, a more flexible approach is, uh, for want of a better word, the ontology uh, based technologies. Um, being driven, for example, by the semantic web, you know, the need to, to uh, pull together uh, vast volumes of uh, relatively unstructured data. So the ontologies are a really powerful uh, tool for all that. You can say uh, foxes eat rabbits uh, in, your, in your ontology. Uh, you can also say, you know, Freddy Fox ate Peter Rabbit, the, the next uh, more concrete thing. Um, but if your fox is a credit card and your rabbit is a purchase, then Visa or MasterCard uh, can't afford flexibility in a global system like that. They want something very concrete. So maybe the pure ontology-based approach 
uh, is not opinionated enough. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, Visa and Mastercard still want to analyze and slice and dice uh, their data, say for data mining for for fraud, for example. So let's uh, ha let's have a look at the data warehouse uh, kind of approach. Uh, these um, star schema type approaches are optimized for slicing and dicing data. Uh, there are facts, and they can be accessed and summarized by dimensions like uh, geography or time scale or sales channel. Uh, of course, they uh, they become massively large, and uh, the issue becomes that they're hard coded to the original design. If you um, think of a new access path, or you want to add new data uh, to an to an environment like this, then you've got to work through IT, and uh, that can be a process that's anything but agile. So uh, that brings us to uh, data point modeling. So uh, data point modeling shares many of the elements of the other approaches. Um, they're all part of the same family after all, you know, tackling the same kinds of problems. Um, data point modeling is related to the uh, no SQL movement in, in technology, uh, which for me is a, is a backing away from the LDM, Oracle, relational database kind of approach, loosening um, the constraints uh, that were originally put in to guarantee data integrity and um, pu pushing some of those responsibilities back to the developer. Um, but the data point model is, is, is more concrete than the ontology based way of thinking, um, so there's no looser type concepts like you know, this thing is like that thing. Uh, the recent uptake of uh, data point modelling uh, owes a lot to the uh, global financial crisis. Um, you can read a quote here from FRS Global, uh, who are a player in the reg space of the finance industry. Uh, I'm going to be using the, um, the XBRL abstract model as my uh, data point example. Um, the, the Dave Frankel and Herm Fisher and the other guys on that team uh, have done a, done a great job. And uh, besides that, every bank and insurance company in the, in the world, it seems, is being frog-marched down the XBRL path by, by their regulators who are demanding they submit all their new regulatory reports in XBRL. Um, XBRL stands for Extensible Business Reporting Language. Um, as a technology, it uh, originally was based on in, in XML. Um, and... Uh, it uh, has a concept of taxonomies. You know, for example, the SEC in the uh, states uh, have quarterly filings, and annual filings to an XBRL taxonomy. Uh, but in addition to that, it, it allows extensions um, by individual submitters. Um, so the scope is um, pretty much all business data, accounts, um, social responsibility, carbon footprint reporting is being done in XBRL. Um, and it's being mandated, it seems, by everybody. Uh, the SEC in the States, the Europeans, uh, the governments of Australia and Singapore, the St China Stock Exchange. Um, yeah, so, in short, pretty much all uh, public uh, company data uh, is moving to XBRL. So, in data point modeling, we've got uh, a few features to call out. Um, you can see that the data has been cut up into its atomic components or, or, or data points. Um, but we've also uh, aspects or dimensions um, which uh, can be assembled dynamically. So every piece of, of data uh, is a data, every piece of controlled data is a data point. Um, every data point is uniquely defined and, and defined only once. And every data point is triangulated by uh, any number. Uh, of dimensions or aspects. So you can see some features here shared with other approaches. I think of it uh, like the uh, global positioning system of data. So uh, on the Earth, every, um, every point on the Earth is uniquely identified by a latitude longitude key. And equally, um, can be uniquely found by triangulating uh, from the circling satellites uh, which in this analogy are the aspects. To demonstrate the implications of this, let's have a look at EDGAR, the SEC system for publishing 
the report submitted to them. We could uh, search for JPM, JP Morgan, uh, and filter on uh, 10Ks, the uh, annual report submitted by, submitted by the banks. Uh, let's select uh, an instance document yeah, using the blue button. So the first thing to, to notice is how structured, uh, is highly structured uh, the information is. Um, you can see that uh, from the directory structure uh, on the left here. By clicking on uh, any of the data items, uh, we get to see uh, more information. We get to see the definition and uh, any of the other uh, data defined in the uh, taxonomy. So we've got here something highly structured, uh, well documented, and consistent uh, with all the other 10K filings by both, obviously, JP Morgan and, any, and anybody else. Uh, but it uh, gets better. Any firm can submit. Uh, with their return uh, an extension. So they can send in data that it is special, differentiating uh, about themselves. So let's just go back to the actual submitted files and at the bottom here you'll see uh, an extensions.xml. So we'll open this up and uh, we'll see JP Morgan providing uh, extra detail right, that's special uh, uh, only to them. Uh, according to them. Uh, still di still integrated uh, but different. So we've got uh, what we're looking at here is one massive amount of data to have it have at your fingertips. Every filing from every company in the US in a well structured well documented uh, form um, and yet we're also getting to see uh, flexibility extensions and um, individual firms getting a view of the data that they want to, to, to um, talk to. So let's dive a bit deeper uh, to see how data point modeling has uh, contributed to this, to has enabled uh, this. And we'll do that using a RHEL, uh, the open source XBRL tool. After opening a RHEL, uh, we can navigate to a similar uh, JP Morgan document and have a look under the hood. We can see here the uh, the facts table, which is the, the listing of all the uh, all the data in the report. Um, we can see the presentations being defined and how the information can be viewed. Um, under calculations, we get to see the derivations and, and how they are all defined. And under dimensions, we get to see how you can um, and slice and dice the data. So I don't know, but if it's just me, but this looks horrendously complex, right? Uh, the front end looked great. Edgar looks fant is fantastic, uh, but the, the detail of how that's done is uh, is really complicated. Uh, first thing to say, from my point of view, is that uh, this um, is based on a huge amount of fantastic work uh, done by the standards bodies, government departments, and uh, and quite incredibly a lot of volunteers. Um, so the, the time and effort to get all these details agreed by so many people from around the world, uh, well, it's, well, it's unseen and, and certainly unthanked, but it really is, has, to me, it's just incredible uh, and uh, sort of inspiring. Um, and the second thing to say, I think, is that you know, simplicity is genius. You know, is, if we could find a way of making this simple, well, that, that would be some kind of genius, right? So with uh, apologies to uh, all the people who thanklessly put uh, in all the hard work, um, this is my mental model of the uh, XBRL abstract model. Uh, with this relatively simple toolkit, or point, paint by numbers approach, um, you can build the world's business big data solution. There's a, a few uh, data point concepts to call out. Firstly, uh, data points have values. Uh, actually, they have a, a number of values. Um, there's the value value, uh, or the or the reportable value. So, you know, 100 widgets were sold in August uh, by the Delaware branch. Uh, 100 um, is a value of the data point, um, but then there's also values for widgets, August, Delaware branch. Right? Um, values come in sets, like all the months of the year, all the products, all the branches. And of course, the uh, the values and value sets are of the same type. Um, so that's the aspect concept. 
you know, like we saw in the data warehouse model with um, with the dimensions. Uh, secondly, we've got uh, an opinion on how we want the data presented. All right, and for that, we've got concepts like tables and tables of axes with uh, data points triangulated by axis coordinates. Um, other information about the data point might be the definition, the label, the label in another in another language, um, the source could be anything. Um, this meta model uh, is represented by these um, resource uh, concepts. Um, the report obviously has to be related to the real world, and and I've called this the uh, business classes. Uh, this is not uh, part of the experimental abstract model, but it's something I need to be able to talk about building reports in the real world. So that's this uh, concept here. And um, lastly, the cube concept um, is a way to express partitioning of the data into buckets. Mm. So that's a rather abstract uh, model. It's a rather abstract model, and deliberately so. Um, but the question is, how can we relate this to the real world? I thought that the uh, best way of um, looking at how to exploit data point modeling um, would be to put into a context. So um, let's have a look at an end-to-end -end process. So here I've drawn a, a flow uh, from business data uh, from, the, from the transactional management sort of domain uh, to the consumption by say a manager or a regulator or an analyst. So we're showing here uh, both the, the function in the process and examples of the supporting technologies or, or tools. We've got an, uh, an ontology for here for the high level overarching concepts. Um, typically Oracle will be a technology for concrete transaction processing. Uh, people use a lot of Oracle for the data warehouse or you know, no, no SQL technologies contribute here as well. Um, in the reporting and analytics space you have uh, technologies like uh, business objects. Uh, for business domain modeling um, we've got tools like Magic Draw and Enterprise Architecture. Arch Enterprise Architect. Um, I'm doing uh, a solution in this space here, Model the R, that supports data point modeling and, and XBRL taxonomy design. Uh, with Arel and Edgar where we have examples of technology for managing and viewing XBRL data and taxonomies. So you know this is this is a, a subjective, simplified view, of course, um, but uh, but I think it shows the sweet spot for data point modeling between the the concrete transactional world of Oracle, and the uh, flexible, flexible generic world of ontologies, um, where there's less structure and and uh, less concrete rules. So let's take a few minutes to look at how we might uh, manage uh, putting these into place. We can uh, now jump across into Magic Draw, um, the UML modeling tool used by XBRL uh, to model their X abstract model. Um, down here we have a, a palette of business report design objects uh, based on the abstract model. You can see I've uh, designed a report on the on the right hand side. Um, one way to do that is to uh, drag and drop report elements uh, from the uh, palette into the design diagram and then uh, wire the design together. Uh, another would be to uh, import from Excel or, or a taxonomy. Either way you can see when the uh, design breaks the rule of the abstract model it, it turns red. Uh, in this case the aspect hasn't been allocated to a cube. Um, on the uh, left hand side uh, we have a business domain logical data model so this is the view of the data uh, in this example business. Uh, the links between the, the two uh, models or diagrams describe how this business fills out the report using their own data. So now I can uh, run this macro report and I'll get a, uh, I'll call it functional spec uh, that IT can uh, use to write the report extract uh, or even uh, use code generation. Um, uh, also, of course, the business can use this to uh, to sign off that uh, the design meets their requirements. And so, um, with this kind of capability, with this de demonstrating this kind of capability, uh, I hope you get a sense of what's possible. N not only 
are we talking about with uh, data point modeling and XBRL, uh, the uh, management of instance documents and uh, the consumption of, of, of data as we saw with the SEC in a, in, in a uh, sort of higher value way. Uh, but we're also talking about how we manage uh, data. Uh, we're able to manage it with kind of new speed, quality, flexibility and uh, and, and uh, in both the design of the data and, and the technology used to, to manage it. So we've seen how data point modeling fits into the, the suite of uh, data management approaches. Um, firstly, it brings um, both structure and agility to, to instance data, as we saw with the SEC example. You know, data quality and uh, usability is enhanced. Uh, secondly, we've seen how data, tech, data and uh, technology management is also both more agile and, and, and better structured, more automated. So the implication is that if you're one of the uh, the firms around the world uh, mandated to, to complete an XBRL taxonomy like CoREP or Solvency 2, uh, adding the data point modeling design approaches and tooling to your kit bag uh, gives you the possibility of something much faster and cheaper uh, than if you treat, treat it as a, as a spreadsheet filling exercise. For, for me, uh, far more importantly, uh, than even that. Data point modeling, design and tooling op opens up the possibilities for uh, in-house analytics, flexible reporting, comparability. Um, you can do these things with a quality, low cost and agility um, that uh, is not easy with the other approaches um, which are, tend to be designed for, for other kinds of problems. So thanks for joining me. My hope is that you got a, a sense of the possibilities. Uh, you'd be doing me a big favour uh, to reach out to me and to continue the conversation. Uh, not, not only would I be uh, uh, happy to be as helpful as I, as I possibly can, uh, I'm sure your perspective on, on this can only be helpful to me. So I'll, I'll post these slides to SlideShare where you can uh, get the, access these links. And uh, thanks for participating. Over and out.